American financial power, American monetary power, I think in some ways is greater than it's ever been before. Whatever else is going on with American power in the world, let's say American monetary power in the Middle East, actually the crash in 2008, particularly the way in which the Federal Reserve Board had to act as a, essentially as a lender of last resort to the euro dollar system. Very happy to welcome to Forward Guidance, Helen Thompson, Professor of Political Economy at the University of Cambridge. Helen, great to have you here. I want to ask you, you've been doing a lot of work on Europe and energy. And uh, a year ago, year and a half ago, the prices of energy were sky high and Europe's supply of them, Europe's availability of them was, was very low. And it appeared that there was an energy crisis that was about to get very worse. But it's my understanding that since that time, A, the winter in Europe was was mild, and B, uh, prices went down. So the crisis has been averted. Is that roughly accurate to say? And then, how do you, you know, are you are you still worried, or are there still worries about Europeans' energy supply with the you know, Russia, the ongoing war between Russia and Ukraine? I think we have to like separate this out a bit into questions about gas and questions about oil. I think in terms of gas, where the temperatures during the winter was obviously a, a, a crucial factor. What we can see is that the Europeans benefited, benefited from, firstly, good fortune, the weather, but they also benefited from their ability to force prices up in liquid natural gas markets and make it more difficult for a number of Asian countries in those markets, particularly Pakistan. So Pakistan, beginning of 2022, had long-term liquid natural gas contracts with a number of um, liquid natural gas companies, Qatar, United States. And it found that it was shut out of those contracts because it was worth it for the companies to break the contracts, pay the penalties and sell the gas to European countries in spot markets. So Germany began 2022, obviously, with no liquid natural gas imports. Indeed, it had no liquid natural gas ports to import. Um, the stuff. Uh, And yet it could use essentially its wealth to be competitive in those spot markets that Pakistan was being shut out of. So it isn't just a question of good fortune, um, where the weather is concerned. It's also a question of essentially the, the, the wealth of European economies protecting them in that competition between European countries and Asian countries. The, the thing that's a little bit more uncertain on the gas side, I think, is the role that China played in this because China's demand for liquid natural gas imports fell quite sharply in 2022, having risen very sharply in 2021 and caused a gas price shock before, several months before uh, Putin decided to invade um, Ukraine. China's demand then dropped in 2022, and it's not so clear whether it was because China's economy was relatively weak in 2022, so demand fell for that reason. Whether they were worried about what was happening in terms of European ability to force prices um, up, and then what the long-term implications of that would be about China's attitude towards gas. I think we can see this year that China's very much back in the um, market, even though the Chinese economy hasn't recovered as well as many hoped that it um, would. So I think that if China's back in the market, then that means that it's more difficult for European countries than it was during 2022. And we should also bear in mind that for the first six months of 2022, at least, European countries were buying gas normally from Russia. I mean, there were no sanctions on the export of Russian gas. That Those imports from Russia by pipelines came to an end because the Russians stopped providing the gas through the pipelines, particularly through Nord Stream 1, um, before um, it was um, detonated in September um, of um, last year. So this isn't, I think, anything like a straightforward European success story in dealing uh, with the gas crisis. On the oil side, the prices peaked around May or June of 2022 and then came down. And then we've seen in the last few months that they've been back up again, sort of fairly steadily over the $90 a barrel um, level. 
I think that you can see two things that really explain why that they came down uh, after the initial surge on Russia's invasion. The first of them is back to China, China's weak demand, given the conjunction of zero COVID policies and property sector problems that China had last year. And the second of them is the amount of oil that the Biden administration ordered released from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, about 180 million barrels um, all um, together. So actually, one way of looking at that might be saying, well, the prices didn't come down so far. They didn't really much ever really go much under $70 a barrel, if that's $75 a barrel, despite the fact that there was weak demand from the world's largest oil importer and the world's largest oil producer was using its strategic petroleum reserve. So I don't think that we should think that the energy problems where fossil fuel energy concern, fossil fuel energy is concerned are anywhere near over for European countries. And that's leave, even leaving aside what might now happen given what's going on in the Middle East. Right. And for our viewers, uh, gas is hard to transport. So it's typically you know, through a pipeline, which is it takes a long time to build. And if you want to transport it over water, you have to uh, liquefy it, then, then regasify it, whereas oil is somewhat easier to, to transport. So what happened to the Russian gas that was uh, flowing through the, the pipelines uh, from, from Russia to the rest of Europe? Were, were they selling it with liquefied natural gas to the rest of the world? And is there an aspect of, you know, folks in Europe saying, oh, we're not buying Russian gas, gas, but they're buying it from India and China and uh, India and China are buying it from Russia. So it's, you know, if you look at the supply, it's actually it hasn't hasn't changed that much. There has been more of a fall in the export of Russian gas than there has been in the export of Russian um, oil. But what is undoubtedly the case, which is you're kind of hinting at, Jack, is, is that Russia has to some extent, not com anywhere near completely, compensated for selling less pipeline gas by selling more liquid natural gas. And indeed, it's it's got a new liquid natural gas port on the Baltic that it didn't have at the beginning, that wasn't open at the um, beginning of the war. And that port um, is used to export liquid natural gas to a number of European countries, not always like directly. Um, so for instance, the Germans are not insignificant consumers of liquid natural gas from Russia, but it comes via Belgium, particularly Porter, um, Antwerp, um, rather than directly into the, the the sort of temporary sort of floating um, ports that Germany constructed during the course of, of 2022. There's no doubt that Russia is making a move. I mean, it, was, it had started this before the war, but it, it's now uh, doubled down on that move to increase its capacity to sell gas by essentially maritime means rather than pipelines either under the sea or um, under um, under land. When you go to oil, you can see that there's not really much difference in the volume of oil that's been exported from uh, Russia since the, the war began. And part of the reason for that is that European countries might not be buying Russian crude or not at least as anywhere near as much Russian crude, but Russian exports to India in particular, China to some extent, but really very much to India, have gone up quite considerably. Uh, and then it's refined in India and China uh, into petroleum products that are then sold back into, into, into European countries. And the fact that the oil sanctions such as they are have basically been around a price cap tied to shipping insurance essentially tells you in itself that even the people who are keenest on sanctions against Russia know that the world can't actually get by without Russian oil exports, whether they be crude or petroleum products. And if they could, then oil would be sanctioned. What the sanctions were trying to do, though they don't look now like they're succeeding, is to try to put a cap on the revenue that Russia could gain from its exports of oil. And that was 70 or $65, and was that was only it's imposed by... Six, uh, by some $60. European nations, sixty dollars. Well, it was supposed to be. It was. It was supposed to be imposed by everybody, but the, the, there were some exemptions for it because uh, the there's the issue for a number of European um, countries, uh, probably most significantly Austria and Hungary, of being landlocked, so that they're dependent upon the the the, 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 the pipelined um, oil that was coming that way was 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 still allowed under these arrangements.
what about green energy? So I suppose mainly uh, wind and solar. We'll, we'll get onto to nuclear in a moment. Europe has been uh, probably you know one of the most active parts of the world over the past decade in investing in this uh, green infrastructure. How has that infrastructure helped Europe? Uh, uh, you know, with the surge surge in natural gas, and how are things changes? Because you know, I'm just I'm just reading news articles about. You know, a wind product project is being shut down and a nuclear project is being shut down. I would think that if you have this energy problem in, in uh, Europe, that they would be doubling down on, uh, on green infrastructure. So tell us what, just what's going on there. Yeah, th- this is quite a, a complicated um, story. I think that there's no doubt that there has been a push to increase the capacity of basically the solar and wind capacity for generating uh, electricity um, in Europe. And uh, whilst obviously there was a drive for that before Russia's invasion of Ukraine, that the war intensified that and has led to increased um, capacity. But as we know, with solar and wind, increased capacity doesn't necessarily um, mean increased output. So I think it's for, either from the second or the third quarter of last year for the UK, you can see sharp, quite a sharp increase in solar and wind capacity during the quarter. Um, but actually the output is down on the quarter because the weather conditions are not con- were not sufficiently conducive for solar and wind um, output to be to be um, high. So where a decarbonized electricity is concerned, where well, I should say solar and wind decarbonized electricity, it's not simply a question of of, of, of um, capacity because at the moment we're not in a position where large scale storage of electricity generated by solar and wind is possible meanwhile on the on the nuclear side one of the things that was going on in in Europe last year was that the french were having particular problems um with maintenance um with their nuclear reactors so for a good part of 2022 french nuclear power output was about 50% of what it would usually be so usually france would be an exporter of electricity to other European countries, including um, the United Kingdom. But during the course of 2022, is that it was a a significant net importer at times. uh, And actually, the UK was exporting electricity to to France, which had been unheard of for like about several decades before that. There was an issue about the alternatives and how, in one sense, reliable that they were for one reason or another. So whatever the intention and whatever the desire to get away from either fossil fuel energy or in the German case, to get away from um, nuclear, is the actual reality of of doing that turns out to be uh, significantly like more um, complicated um, than um, that. If you then look at it in terms of the European Union and the European Union's uh, energy future where the generation of electricity um, is concerned, What has now happened is that there's a real impasse between a group of states led by France and a group of states led by Germany about whether nuclear power should be part of green, it should be considered green um, energy. And that's meaning that it means that it's become quite hard to agree common policies across quite a range of specific energy um, areas um, because the Germans don't want nuclear power in and the French insist that it must be in because... For the French, under uh, Macron anyway, past the first few years of his his presidency, he's very much committed to maintaining, to have what he calls a a nuclear renaissance renaissance for the French nuclear power industry. In Germany's case, obviously, the nuclear power stations and reactors have all been shut down now. Can you explain the criticism of nuclear power and the, the politicians who are, are representing that view is is, is that it's, it's dangerous or what? What is it? Is it mainly that or is, what else? There's a number of different things that are, that have gone on here. If we just take like the the, the German um, case where the anti nuclear movement's been the strongest, is that if you go back to the 1970s um, when there was a big push for um, nuclear power. It wasn't the origins of the push for nuclear power, obviously, but it, that's the decade when the French really uh, commit very, very strongly to uh, making nuclear power central to the generation of electricity um, in um, France. What you see in, in Germany, in West Germany, as it then was, is a quite significant, if you like, civil protest movement 
around it on environmental grounds, on safety um, grounds. And that's very much, in a way, the origins of the West German, then now German Green Party and the Chernobyl uh, nuclear. It was anti-nuclear, e- even yeah. though nuclear has essentially zero carbon emissions. When you say environmental, what is the environmental it's, it's the environmental is is about the the waste nuclear waste is about yeah. nuclear waste uh, and what happens to it um, when the uh, reactors uh, are, are are finished uh, essentially. So and Chernobyl disaster in uh, 1986 intensified the anti nuclear sentiments in in um, in West Germany. I think it's also true though that there's a significant geopolitical difference between France and West Germany in the 70s and um, 80s. West Germany found that it had to worry in the 70s about where it got enriched uranium from, including because by the late 1970s, the Carter administration was embargoing the export of enriched uranium out of the United States. France, meanwhile, had a number of former colonies, not least Niger, where till this day, about 25% of the uranium for French um, nuclear power um, comes from. So whilst nuclear power didn't solve the, if you like, foreign resource dependency problem for West Germany, it a little bit more did for um, for France. Now, I think if you move on then to like the, the 2010s, obviously it's Fukushima, um, the reactor, uh, the Japanese reactor that pushes Merkel into making the decision to end West sorry, German nuclear power within um, 10, 11 years um, from that. You actually see, particularly under Francois Hollande, the French, um, the then, well, he became French president in 2012, actually a quite strong commitment from him that France should at least radically reduce its dependence upon nuclear power. So you kind of see some convergence. Obviously, the French aren't about to get rid of all their nuclear um, reactors, but some of the maintenance problems that materialized in 2022, you might put down to the fact that Olan was a lot less committed to nuclear power than his predecessors. And Macron was in the same position when he first came in um, to power. But over the last few years, he's very much gone in the opposite direction. And particularly, I'd say, so since the, um, since, since the invasion um, of um, Ukraine. So he's now very much that nuclear power is to be the center of France's decarbonized um, electricity. And that simply isn't the case in in Germany, um, quite the opposite. Now, you can argue, and this is obviously part of the arguments that are made um, by anti-nuclear advocates, is to say that nuclear power is incredibly expensive. It is. It's very, uh, I think it's um, fair to say that there's something about nuclear power and France's a uh, rather singular commitment to it from the 70s that might be explained by what might be called the vanity of the French state and the willingness to spend lots of sums of money on these huge technological um, projects. But the attraction of it is, is that if you spend the money, and it is long-term money that you're spending in long-term in terms of building things, then it delivers electricity all the time and not on an intermittent basis like solar and wind do without um, storage capacity. When we say nuclear is expensive, I don't, you know, even begin to, to know enough to, to make an analysis of that, but I just observe that folks who make claims about the expensiveness of relative uh, sources of energy relative to, to another, it's, 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 how, it's how you measure it, right? For example, I, you know, 10 years ago, I was reading, you know, Bloomberg articles about how wind is cheaper than natural gas. I, I would think that if that was truly true, that you know, we wouldn't be using, no one would be using natural gas at all, at all now. Again, it's, 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 it's how you measure it. And I also noticed the price of uranium, um, you know, a huge bull market in uranium from 2000, 2007. And then we had a bear market, you know, price of uranium went down. How much, when you say it's expensive, is in building the plant, getting sure, you know, uh, having people, compliance people work with regulators. And in other words, not the true economic cost versus the actual cost of uranium, because now, uranium went down from 2007 to 2019, 2020, or 2016 maybe, and now it's uh, surging ag- again. Yeah, I mean, I, I, th- I think a lot, of, a lot of the costs are basically capital, the capital expenditure uh, of building uh, nuclear um, reactors. Um, and I think that 
the uranium um, costs are not, I wouldn't say that they're insignificant, um, but they, they're not really the same as the, uh, the, the, the costs of, of, of literally like building things. I mean, just to give you an example, when the David Cameron uh, first became like British um, prime minister, the coalition government with the Liberal Democrats here in the United Kingdom, they were committed to building um, nuclear, new nuclear reactors uh, as long as it, the Conservative manifesto said there were no public subsidies for that. Well, you know, by 2015, 2016, they're having to change their minds about that and effectively provide government guarantees to try to get the Chinese to invest in building nuclear power reactors in the UK. Um, so it's pretty difficult to do the financing without, at the very least, the state backing um, those um, those projects. And I think that is part of the story. I think in terms of the wind cost issue, like versus gas costs, I mean, the narrative you'll hear, you know, repeated endlessly um, in one sense correctly um, by people who think that we can go a lot faster on solar and wind will say, well, look how price how cheap the price um, is, not just against other uh, possibilities as the primary energy source for electricity, but also against the costs of what solar and wind was 10 years ago, 15, 20 um, years ago. The thing is, though, the, you're not really comparing something that's necessarily useful in doing that because you've got to think about that's just kind of like the unit cost of actually producing that unit of, of energy, of electricity, sorry, from that source but you've got to think about the system costs of like of basically running electricity generating electricity from multiple um, energy sources because nobody's in the position where they can run the whole thing off of solar and wind there's effectively even in the, a country like you know like Denmark where it can be pretty high is there's got to be some backup essentially like operation and if you're shutting you say let's just say coal fired power stations for the sake of argument if you're shutting them um, opening them up, shutting them back down again when they're not needed, the costs of that are, 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 are quite considerable. So it's really, I think, the system cost that has to be thought about rather than the unit level cost of a, of a unit of energy being produced, the unit of electricity being produced. Uh, let's, let's take a turn back to uh, finance. So the interest rates in the US are at 5.5% uh, for, for, for the upper range. And I'm just taking taking a look at the Bank of England as well as the European Central Bank ECB. Um, the sense is in that is that the Federal Reserve is perhaps done completely with hiking interest rates, and if they have another hike, it's it's just one. So the peak will be 5.75 percent. Are you thinking, or is there, what is the perception across the pond uh, um, where where we are that uh, the Bank of England and the European Central Bank will also be done, and if the Fed starts cutting rates, may may, may cut cut rates as, as well. And also, can you perhaps comment on just the dominance of the Federal Reserve? In other words, that other other central banks, including you know very powerful central banks such as the European Central Bank, kind of you know to have, have to follow the Fed. The Federal Reserve's actions have an impact on the, on the rest of the world that they have to respond to, uh, with the notable exception, perhaps, of the Bank of, of Japan. Yeah, I mean. On that question, I'll take that question um, first. I, I, I think that it's undoubtedly the case, not only that the Fed is the uh, trendsetter, if we could call it, um, that setting the pace, and that's true actually on the way up as on the as on the on 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 the way down, um, because there are clearly a number of European central banks, including the Bank of England, if the, if they looked at inflation in the UK. Um, earlier might have come to the conclusion that they should have started raising interest rates, but didn't actually until the Fed um, was in um, action. I think it's pretty clearly the case that the Federal Reserve's, the impact of Federal Reserve monetary decision-making is now significantly greater than it was, say, in the period before the crash. So I've spent quite some time in, I spent quite some time in, in uh, my book, uh, disorder talking about the way in which um, American financial power, American monetary power, I think in some ways is greater than it's ever been before. Whatever else is going on with American power in the world, let's say American monetary power in the Middle East, 
actually the crash in 2008, particularly the way in which the Federal Reserve Board uh, had to end, had to act as a essentially as a lender of last resort to the euro dollar system, and then became the provider of dollar swaps and choosing who dollar swaps were um, going to, um, and then being able to for financial for have to see I should say to see its decisions not even just sometimes its decisions, but its promises of making decisions cause financial market instability like in, in other countries. Think back to what happened in China in 2015, 2016, just on the prospect the Fed was going to raise interest rates by a quarter of a percent at the end of, uh, of 2015. That's a, a, a quite notable um, increase in the influence of the, 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 um, that the Fed has. I think the difficulty for the, the central banks now, and I wouldn't exempt the Fed from this, is that on the energy side, and we can see this in, in oil prices over the last six weeks, perhaps, or um, so it's maybe slightly um, longer, um, that the pressure is back upwards again. Uh, so that if energy was at the center of the inflationary shock of 2000 and late 2021 and into 2000, or really second half of 2021 and into 2022, it may be coming back um, again. Now, I think if you think about that in terms of macroeconomic side, you might say there's already sufficient evidence that actually prices above $90 a barrel um, start crashing demand, that they basically destroy um Demand and that might be true about China now um, as well. So in that sense, um, the inflationary pressure will will ease off. That high prices actually just brings high prices down. The unknown, obviously, that now has to be put into thinking about this is whether there will be a geopolitical shock coming out of the Middle East and whether that means whether you have one of the yeah. either oil or indeed perhaps gas producers like uh, Qatar uh, actually using prices or even potentially even an embargo um, as a weapon in this conflict um, with um, Israel. So something more akin to what happened in uh, October 1973 when the Arab members of OPEC um, decided both to increase the prices you know, by about 400% effectively and embargoed the United States um, and um, and the and uh, the Netherlands. Now, you can say, which is obviously the case, that having a monetary response to that hardly fixes the problem. But at the same time, I think it's going to be if that if something something in that space happens, it's going to be an interesting question as to whether the central banks just say, well, we just have to absorb the inflationary hit because it's not really coming um, on the monetary side. Um, I think that might be hard if we saw a really sharp increase in oil prices in the case of the United States and perhaps gas prices in the case of Europe. I mean, oil and gas prices in the case of Europe. So, so earlier when you said, and I'm paraphrasing that, uh, the U.S. the power of the Federal Reserve and the U.S. Monetary Authority on a global scale is perhaps the, the highest it's ever been. How uh, how did you reach that conclusion? Can you explain your thinking there? In, in other words, what does the Federal Reserve do now or did uh, three years ago or 2008 that it wouldn't have done in, let's say, 1990 when you think of the U.S. global authority as being you know, very preeminent? It's partly about how much discretion other states have or other central banks, I should say, obviously have uh, in order or how much discretion they have to ignore the decisions that the Fed makes. So do they not have to put interest rates up when the, the, the Fed um, put um, interest rates up? Now, in some ways, I think if you go to Europe, this comparison, if you go to try and compare like with the 1980s, it's quite hard to disentangle because You've got to add into the picture in the 80s in Europe, the West German Central Bank, the Bundesbank, and the European exchange rate mechanism as a monetary system that as the decade went on hard and such, that it was in a way the response of the Fed to 
how the Bundesbank Bank responded to what the Fed did, and then everybody else in the exchange rate mechanism having to respond to what the Bundesbank Bank did. So there you have a situation where I think this, uh, one of the French central bankers at one point quipped that French monetary sovereignty lasted as long as it took Frankfurt to pick up the phone to Paris <laughs> and tell them that they were were changing um, interest rates. If you look, though, say, at like 1987, around the time of like um, the Louvre Accord, the Bundesbank was kind of really doing its own thing at that point in regard to the Fed. And then everybody else in the exchange rate mechanism was was like having to um, having to um, deal um, with um, that. Now, I think if you then move on to the, the 2010s, the, the issue isn't perhaps Europe in the same way that European Central Bank really did something rather different than the Fed in the 2008 to 2015 period. Because remember that the Fed didn't introduce quantitative easing until until 2015. Though what I meant was is that the Fed, they, if they, there's a seven year gap between, mm-hmm. so you could, what I'm trying to say is you couldn't say this is the ECB following like what the what the Fed um, did in that period. I think the one that's really interesting in the in the 2010s, which shows it shows the change, is really the China comparison. Because if you go back to before 2008. You've got all that worry being expressed in all kinds of different ways. Think about what Lawrence Summers said about the balance of financial um, terror, that actually Chinese purchase of U.S. debt was a constraint on a number of aspects of American um, uh, policy. And you might say that it, that it was possible at times that the Fed had to bear that in mind, shall we say, when deciding whether to tighten interest rates or, 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 or not. But you go on to 2015 and are saying that period when the Fed's talking under Janet Yellen about whether it's going to raise rates or not, you've got the prospect of that quarter percent raise in December of that year, which is the first mm-hmm. rate increase see, since the, the, the crash. You've got even the prospects of that causing financial market havoc in, 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 in China in, in, in 2015 that spilled over again early 2016 after the interest rate increase had made that summer, so summer 2015 now, China was having to tighten its um, its um, capital controls. It's quite hard, I think, to think about that kind of set of events happening in the pre-2008 world in quite the same way, certainly where China was concerned. So there's the saying that when the you know, U.S. catches a... Um when the U.S. coughs, the rest of the world catches a cold. When the Federal Reserve does a little bit of interest rate, it causes a, a uh, disproportionate impact uh, on uh, uh, other countries, particularly emerging market countries. And uh, the example you cited of, oh, there's a rumor of a 25 basis point hike that put the Chinese property market uh, in, into distress. And, uh, oh, you know, Bernanke makes a comment about the, the, we're, we may do some tapering and suddenly some emerging market currency has a huge de- depreciation. Uh, has the resilience of of many emerging market economies and markets and currencies uh, surprised you? Or do you have views on it? It's definitely surprised me. You know, you think back to what what, what we just talked about those examples, as well as uh, you know, 1997 in Thailand. It seems like emerging markets uh, are are somewhat stable, and that the, the U.S. the Federal Reserve has you know uh, issued the most violent cough you know since uh, 1980 or 81, and in terms of going from zero to five. Uh, to, to 5.25 or 5.5 percent, and uh, so far everything seems so f- uh, fine so far. And you know, China is, is uh, has its own issues, but to, to my untrained eye, it seems like a lot of that is uh, self inflicted uh, or you know policy, as opposed to oh, it's struggling because the Fed is raising rates. Yeah, I mean, I think you can see uh, some countries um, where the um, conjunction of events last year between the Fed raising rates the energy situation um and indeed sometimes climate related events like the flooding um i'm thinking particularly of pakistan here where the the cumulative effect of it all uh, on currency uh weakening weakening currency issues with whether it Debt can be repaid or not. Need for you know IMF credit. That some of those older patterns where where we would expect from the eighties, um, where you have 
the Fed raising rates and causing issues for what then developing countries now, um, emerging markets. I could think you can see bits of it in what happened um, last year. I mean, I agree with you that we haven't had like spectacular cases. We've not had something that looks like Mexico in 19, or some, not anything of the size of Mexico, at least that looks like Mexico in 1982. Uh, or as you say, in terms of just sheer currency crisis, what happened to in the Asian financial crisis in in ninety seven, um, ninety um, eight, but I don't think that the underlying, if you like, structural dynamics of this are so different. In the sense, I wouldn't be too optimistic that there aren't plenty of issues. Uh, around emerging market and debt and currencies ahead. I mean, I'm not saying that there necessarily will be either. I, I'm, I'm just saying I don't think we're out of this um, position that we are in the monetary cycle yet. How do you think about sovereign debt levels as a political economist? You, you think a lot about inequality, you talk about the you know, uh, arist aristocratic uh, excesses of uh, you know, privatization in the, in the 1980s. I guess a very superficial lens would be, uh, you know, a, a, uh, a um, what's the word, a, a social democrat uh, government that has a somewhat generous welfare system would have a large uh, a fiscal deficit and then the conservative one w w would not. Um, by the way, the U.S. in particular, and, and a lot of governments, debt, sovereign debt has increased. Although, interestingly, private debt, uh, you know, is, is it's a much more complicated story. So, I'm not saying that all levels of debt are, you know, have, have exploded higher. But sovereign debt as a percentage of GDP, particularly in the U.S., is very high. Does that change uh, any of the politically, pol political uh, economic calculus in terms of uh, redistribution, in terms of... Uh, how much the Federal Reserve can hike interest rates or keep them high or keep reducing its balance sheets. You know, what is different now that the, the U.S. Uh, GDP is is a much a higher percentage of GDP SP as opposed to, you know, in 1990 or, or 2000? Or does it not matter? And it's actually just an accounting game. And the only thing that truly matters is inflation, at, such as some modern monetary theorists uh, propound. I don't think it's just a matter of, like, uh, of inflation. I, I think that debt does matter and that debt almost always has like distributive consequences. I think that what we're, we've lived through though um, in the post-crash world is a, rather a recalibration of the levels of debt that advanced economy states um, can sustain without really having to worry too much about it in um, in bond markets, or for European countries in particular, in, in foreign exchange markets. Now, I'm not of the view, I think, that um, there is no constraint here any longer, that we've simply moved into a world like where, where debt doesn't matter. I think we've moved, more moved into a world where we don't really know what the levels of debt that matter are, and that we don't really know what the level of um, interest rates for states financing um, debt matter are. Now, if you take like what happened to the you know, Liz Truss government in the UK um, last um, autumn, a whole set of things went into motion, if you like, uh, around that when the budget that her and her chancellor put forward pushed the bond yields over for, for essentially over for long term on bills over ten years over over four percent, and that put a lot of pressure on sterling and those two problems essentially did for that government but British bond yields are back up above that level now um and it's not destabilizing in the in the same way and so the argument then was was like it's all you know feeding through the pension system that the system can't cope any longer with interest rates at that level. And they couldn't at that moment, but now they kind of can. And I think that this is really where, where we're in this kind of like unknown territory. And if you go back to, I think, the summer of 2022, so before this trust was even in power, it was still in the UK, like Boris Johnson, there was a lot of talk. I remember writing some of these things myself 
like about that nobody really knew how far that the Fed could raise rates and other central banks, not the Bank of Japan, but others have to follow without rates reaching the level that would cause financial deep financial market instability, indeed in a systemic in a, in a in a systemic way. Yet they went beyond what many people, perhaps including myself, I think I would include myself in that thought, was a dangerous level where financial markets were concerned. So I think that those days, if you like, in the 80s and the 90s, where the rules of bond markets and foreign exchange markets were relatively like well understood, there was this space where you went, don't be like Mitra in, in his um, early um, years, don't let the pound head below such a whatever level it might be. It might be. I don't think that I, I I don't think that there's a common set of understandings now about where where the limits lie because clearly the limits are radically different than that what they they were in the pre quantitative easing world. If you'd said um, like in 2002 even, let alone in the middle of the 90s or the late um, 80s, that governments would have been able to just um, use debt to deal with the pandemic and shut down the world economy for several months. I think. I mean, I was a, had some level of consciousness about these questions at the time, not much perhaps in the in the last part of the 80s, but in the 90s, you would have been gobsmacked that it would have been possible for for governments to use debt um, in that way. But it turned out that it that it that it was. And then when you throw in the fact that um, governments across the world are committed to essentially an energy revolution, I don't think it's an energy transition; it's an energy revolution in attempting um, essentially to um, reconfigure the entire energy basis of like modern industrial civilization. The only way that that can be done in terms of the amount of investment that it requires and the incentives the private sector needs to invest in what the state itself needs to do is, is going to be through debt. So we're going to keep testing, I think, how far we can go um, without Debt becoming a either a macroeconomic problem or uh, or a, um, a a political problem. I think there's there's lots of space that we that we're still going to learn a lot more about where the limits where they lie, whether they whether they do lie, whether they are there. Yes, and a lot of people talk about an end game, a macro end game of, of how this would end. One situation is devaluation of uh, fiat currencies, in which case you know gold and Bitcoin would do really well. Another uh, way is, uh, I guess, uh, I guess that's also financial repression, where you keep interest rates much lower than inflation, which might require capital controls, which is uh, interesting. You know, the 1940s financial world was very different uh, than than it is currently. Uh, this the second is a debt reduction, and I guess the third is a, a debt jubilee. Uh, but fourth, I suppose, is business as usual. It's just, you know, Tuesday will just be be like Monday. Um, how, how do you think there is? Of course, we you know, you you we know, but no, there is there's never an end game. The, the game never ends. But how do you think uh, this this ends? Or sorry, sorry. How do how do you think this this evolves uh, if we get to that tipping point? I mean, are you going to see weaknesses in currencies? How would you see that if if the dollar weakens, but then the euro also weakens, then neither of them weaken against each other? Uh, w- w- how do you how do you think this evolves? I think the first thing is. is- Jack, you're right. Saying that every time you think that they there might be an end game for this, it it it, it doesn't turn out to be like that. I mean, think back to um, like March of 2020. Um, I think that lots of people have forgotten already, in a way, what a big financial market shock that that was initially. It's just because it was over very quickly in a matter of weeks. But if you look at the the depth of the multiple crises in play in like financial markets is comparable, I think, to what happened in, in, um, in 2008. And there was some sense, I think that look, um, all, all the, um, the bubble, let's just call it that, that had gone on post 2008, finally like burst and there really were limits, but QE Infinity got the thing yeah. and dollar swaps got the show back on the the bubble burst for two weeks and yeah. then it inflated bigger than anyone ever. Yeah, got. and then the, the show got the show got back on like the road again. So you can say, which I would probably say, well, one day the sh- it won't be possible to get the show back on the road again because everything has its limits. I mean, everything in life has its limits. But who the hell knows when that is? 
I mean, like who? I mean, given everything that we've seen since um, 2008, I think it'd be actually utterly foolish to think, okay, next time it will be the time when it's it 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 it's uh, it's over. Um, it's over for good. I mean, I think you can see. I think where you'll see strains are uh, is that as the the costs of servicing the debt become greater, particularly I think in the eurozone, that you will see some like political pressure to say, can we keep going on like this? Now that I think will be in a way independent of the question of whether it's possible to keep going on like this, if you see what I mean. But I, I, I think that there's still sufficient consistencies within um, the Eurozone, perhaps particularly in, in, in Germany, that's that's not convinced that we've now moved into an entirely new era where we just say, actually, debt and more debt as a way of dealing with these economic and, um, e- economic and uh, political problems. Obviously, in the in in the UK, the thing that um, really set in motion Liz Truss's demise was around the pension um, pension funds. That I think is it is another it is a potential at least another point um, of um, vulnerability. I wouldn't be at all surprised if, in the medium term, and I don't really want to say when I think the medium term would be beginning. Um, that we if that we don't head in the direction of some financial repression, and that I think that one of the reasons for that goes back to the the energy revolution like question is I think it really is dubious whether you, we could um, th- even be thinking about right doing this in an era of even just moderately high um, interest rates. The whole premise I think of net zero politics, as it gets called in Europe anyway was the cheap money, cheap monetary um, environment. And so I think that so long as the energy revolution is given the priority that it's being um, given, that the monetary financial world will have to um, adjust, will end up adjusting to that. And could you give a somewhat academic and rigorous definition of financial repression? I suppose the uh, you know common one is just keeping interest rates lower than inflation so that holders of debt are inflated away and debased day day by day. Uh, what is what is the sort of a textbook definition of financial repression? And then how is it enforced and might require capital controls? Because if, if Europe does financial repression and no one else does, guess what? Money's coming to the US. So it, it kind of has to be, you have to keep the money there for it to be debased, right? I'm not so hung up like on... Um, uh, really precise definitions of these economic um, policy um, terms. I, I'd be happy uh, with the, the way in which you um, defined that. But I think that, as you say, that the crucial question then becomes whether it's possible to do it um, without capital controls. I mean, I spent um, quite a bit of time um, in various things that I've done in my uh, academic career uh, looking at the relationship between democratic politics and open capital flows, both um, during the periods um, when they've been there, so say 19, the, the interwar gold standard, 1924, 1931, 1933, whenever you want to end uh, um, the gold standard, and then the um, the Bread and Woods um, period. And um, it's very clear um, that financial repression, which is obviously a premise of the Bread and Woods order, uh, went hand in hand with the formal right of states to use capital controls and the willingness not only of European states to do that, but by the 1960s, the United States itself um, using capital controls. And then I think that the, the world economically and politically changed then in the 70, from 74 onwards, when the Nixon administration began removing the last control, removed the last controls the United States had. And then when Margaret Thatcher's government came in in the UK in 1979 and became the first European state to remove them. And, and so it went on. Uh, and 
I think that it's pretty difficult to see how, for the reasons that Keynes articulated a number of times around the Bretton Woods conference and in some of his like work before that, how you can think that there can be effective political control over interest rates, and that's what ultimately then we're talking about with financial um, repression, without engaging in capital using capital controls. Now, that obviously then raises a big question, which you kind of already got at, Jack, is it's like, well, what on earth did capital, would capital controls mean in the, in the world economy of the, the, the 21st century? They were already pretty difficult um, to operate, um, even in the earlier years of Bretton Woods, certainly by the time the euro dollar markets um, were um, going out of London in the sort of late 19th um, 50s. I remember there's one point, I think it's in 1971, some, at some point around um, the, I think in the build up to Nixon ending dollar gold convertibility, where the West Germans end up trying to ban international telephone calls to try to make their capital controls. Like, well, <laughs> we're not in that. <laughs> and I'm not even sure that that was very successful um, then. But I think that's also in the space of the unknowns that we don't, we, that we, that we don't know. I mean, on the one hand, as I say, for reasons I think that you and I might agree on, we we can see a, a possible trajectory going forward that financial repression is part of it. And I, I don't think you can separate that question from the energy revolution. And at the same time, it's very difficult to see how financial repression works uh, in the financial side of the world economy that we that we know today. Yes. I suppose one thing is just requiring banks to buy tons of government debt. That doesn't necessarily or, uh, local government debt, so not uh, you know French debt or another country's foreign government debt. That, that can be enforced. Well, some of that obviously did go on. I mean, in that sense, you could say that there was de facto. If, if we're going to allow that as kind of like sort of a form of capital controls, there was some of that. I think that went on in the eurozone crisis at a certain point. I mean, I think that some of the measures that the European Central Bank introduced in 2011, 12, in particular, had the effect of strongly incentivizing. Um, the purchase of domestic debt over non, particularly in Italy, over over over, over foreign debt. So yeah, and so I, I'm not going to ask you the, the possible question of when will the monetary order change, when will the baton be passed, but because it's impossible to answer, no one knows that. But do you do you have a view on you know if and when it passed, even if it is in 800 years, the dollar as we know it today. Who will that baton pass it to? Will it be another fiat currency? Some thought the euro. Some thought the uh, Chinese yuan, the renminbi. Uh, or will it be some sort of globalized central bank digital currency, a CBDC? Uh, will there be no uh, monetary hegemon at all, to use a you know, Kindleberger f- phrase? Uh, or... Will it be a return to gold or a hard money such as as Bitcoin, which is uh, you know, certainly not my big case case, but I just want to provide you all the all the uh, available opportunities or uh, an alternative that I did not think of or say? I mean, first of all, I, I'm not somebody who's very convinced that um, de-dollarization is happening um, very significantly or likely to happen like very significantly in the in the short to um medium term and again i wouldn't want to specify how long i thought the medium term um was i think this goes back to my point earlier that uh american financial monetary power is still very considerable i don't think you can just read off like weakness in american military power or american diplomatic weakness in the um the middle east um or even the fact that the American energy power is probably not going to be in 10 years' time what it was in the middle of the 2010s and say that that means that there's such an overall decline in American power that financial and monetary power go down um, with it. I, I don't think it works like that. I, I, I think that the, the dollar is far too central to the world economy still. And that China, on the credit side in particular, the euro dollar system, and I think on the... Uh, case of China, it's very difficult to see how you can think about having the Chinese currency replacing the dollar with the kind of capital controls that China uh, has in um, place. If you look at like Saudi Arabia, uh, clearly wants options generally in what they see of as the emerging multipolar world, very willing to play it both ways where China and the United States is concerned. 
But when it comes to like what the Chinese, sorry, what the Saudis have been purchasing, um, you know, they'd rather buy European football clubs than they that that than be making like financial investments um, in um, in China. So I think that that tells something about the 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 limits of the idea that there's kind of a cohesion of the BRICS into an anti-dollar block. Now that doesn't mean they might not be incentivized to do that. They might not have the desire, but I. I in the world as it actually um, is, I think the uh, incentives don't lie from moving away from the um, moving away from the dollar. I think in terms of if we really try and project a bit further into the future, the, the reason why we get is such a hard question to think about is is because there's only this one previous transition, if you like, to think about. Really, the only one that it, it is only sterling into uh, the dollar. Uh, as the international um, reserve um, currency, and then it, within the period in which the the dollar's been the, the the reserve currency, we ended the backing of gold for the American um, um, currency. So, if we're trying to project from history and look at patterns, there's nothing really, I think, like to look at. Um, and if you look at it, if you try to just in, in, so I don't like generalizing from like one case. I mean, that's just if you want to put it in those um, terms. But if you just do look at that case, the 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 move from like sterling to the dollar, then it's clearly you know fundamentally bound up with the First World War in it for the in the in the in the first instance, and the fact that Britain moved from being such a big creditor to being large debtor in a relatively short period, a really rather short period of time, because of a of a of a world war. So you can't take out the geopolitical context out of that chain. So just doing it in terms of kind of like a monetary and financial perspective, it just it just doesn't really work. So I think in that sense, until we've got a clearer idea like where the the, the, the geopolitics of the world is going, it's quite difficult to see if we're going to use that as a basis for past cases, a basis for thinking about it. It's quite difficult to see where, the, where geopolitically... Um, American power is going. Yes, and the the full transition, the full transition from sterling to dollar required World War One, the Great Depression, and World War Two. So when, when people make a prediction about the dollar is moving to some new monetary order, I say it, it takes a lot of things to to sort of fully enact that transition. And as you said, we have a sample size of of one. Um, uh, so I, I, we've, time is running short. I, I know you got to go, but let's quickly touch on on uh, geopolitics. How do you think U.S.-China uh, relations evolve? What do you what do you think the odds are of uh, rapprochement versus an es- escalation, uh, as well as potential uh, how China what China does with Taiwan? And then also we we should say we're recording this on October twelfth, and uh, you know it is the the uh, ha- 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 Hamas attack on on Israel was uh, less than a week ago, and you know Israel is uh, retaliating, I believe, as as we speak. What are uh, the geopolitical consequences of that? So I know two very hard questions uh, to just close off, but uh, first China and China-US relations and then um, Israel. I mean, I think both of them are like really um, pretty dangerous um, situations. Uh, I think you you can see on uh, US-China that the Biden administration came in with the hope that you could combine a get tough in some areas, get very tough in some areas like semiconductor chips, right? whilst being very open to cooperation in others, most obviously uh, climate um, change. But I think that, that that was always like wishful thinking, to be honest, from the start. And I think one of the problems here is that the one where the US got the most desire for cooperation, climate change, is really ultimately about the energy transition and energy um, revolution. And that how that plays out is going to be pretty central to how the geopolitical competition between the United States and China uh, plays out. And partly it is clear that the fear of God was put into politicians in Washington about what made in China 2025 and China's ambitions around the energy transition would mean for the United States uh, geopolitically. And that that fear that actually, as we changed energy regime, that the geopolitical world would change with it in the same way in which that transition energy-wise from coal to oil, I mean, it's not a change because you're adding oil to coal rather than replacing, but it's central to the demise of British power and the rise of um, 
American um, power. So the idea that you can then take climate change as a kind of like, okay, this is the safe area for cooperation, when actually it's tied to something that's at the heart of the geopolitical competition between the United States and um, China. I think the Taiwan question is is, uh, is 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 really worrying because it isn't just really a question of whatever the level of intent there is in Beijing. If peaceful unification doesn't arrive to use war in order to take Taiwan, it's also I think a question of like how the American how the United States responds if China is able to achieve uh, peaceful unification. Is the United States going to accept? Um, that the politicians in Washington willing to accept that with the consequences that it has that that has in terms of Taiwan's position in the world economy in relation to uh, advanced chips and in relation to the American naval position in the um, in the Pacific. So I think that at the moment you know, there the, the, the aren't really very optimistic um, scenarios uh, around the around the Taiwan um, question that in some sense one side has to think about the issue in a different way and I don't see any evidence that, 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 that that's what's um, happening. So I think that in terms of the, the Middle East, we've obviously entered into a, a new period of that's you know extraordinarily um, dangerous. Um, if we go back to the, the 1970s, we can see how the geopolitical conflicts of the Middle East, not just around Israel um, against the Palestinians, but also Iran's position within the region, spills over into serious economic uh, problems around energy. And then there, that spills over into um, political issues of uh, political problems generated by inflation in, in, um, in um, particular. So I think that there is now a risk um, that we could get into a situation that would be not dissimilar in the sense of if uh, uh, Israel is in a war not only against Hamas, but potentially uh, bringing in Lebanon, even Syria. I, I didn't manage to uh, see all that I was teaching earlier today, but I think I saw something uh, uh, about Damascus Airport um, in what that I'd seen. Um, and I, I might have got that wrong. Um, but it's not in that context of, a, of several wars involving Israel, difficult to see how we might get a number of, of the Arab states and Iran using energy exports as a, as a geopolitical um, weapon. And, and that obviously... Um, is it's dangerous in itself and would have a lot of economic and uh, political repercussions for the rest of the world. Professor Thompson, uh, it's been a pleasure hearing your, your insights. Thank you for sharing them. Uh, people can find you on Twitter at HelenHet20, and people should check out your book, Disorder, Hard Times in the 21st Century. Professor, thanks again, and thanks everyone for watching. Thanks very much, Jack. It's been a pleasure. Forward Guidance, the program you just enjoyed, hopefully, can be viewed on YouTube at BlockWorks Macro or heard as a podcast on Apple Podcast and Spotify. Episodes are typically released on Apple and Spotify a few hours before they air on YouTube. Please leave a review on Apple Podcast if you feel so inclined.